Hey, Leslie, you want to give it a few more minutes? All right. Sure. As okay. people tell me that they are not going to turn on their cameras today, you guys are the worst. <laughs> Oh. Time is money and we're going nowhere fast. <laughs> mm. Makes sense, makes sense. Well, thank you for everyone. Can't see you. Can you see me now? I cannot. Now there we go. <laughs> now All righty. Um, well, thank you everyone for joining us on this call today. Um, and as uh, Leslie stated, we'll we'll get started just now. Uh, we'll get started, you know, as soon as possible. Um, I'll introduce myself. If you don't know, my name is Michael Lewis. I am the um, CEO and founder of a company by the name of My Bag Check, as well as the founder of the Village Collective, which hosts these uh, these weekly uh, webinar events that we have here. So, again, um, you know, welcome to the Diversity and Inclusion series. Again, hosted by the Village Collective and presented by uh, Leslie Short of the Cavo Group. So we're excited to start start this discussion today. Checking the box on women, um, and just a few housekeeping um, things as well. Um, this will be an open and honest discussion as well. Um, if you use the chat function within the um, within you know WebEx. Um, we ask that you use a sequential number. So, for example, the first person who has a question, just put the number one there, wait to be called upon. The next person who has a question after that, put the number two, so on and so forth. 
And that gives us the ability to um, unmute your mic and give you the floor to ask the question and um, which is going to spark um, discussion as well. And Leslie, feel free as well too to um, pull the numbers. The whole system? Yeah, to, to pull the numbers from it and ask those questions in there. Um, the last five minutes we will, um, last five to six minutes, we will have time so everyone can network amongst themselves. If you want to share like your, your Twitter handle or your LinkedIn, um, your LinkedIn uh, URL, you're more than welcome to do that because we want to make sure that everyone walks away with, um, with uh, feeling edified um, after these type of discussions. So, <laughs> so yeah, without further ado, um, since I did put her bio in the Eventbrite, I won't go through her entire bio again. Um, I'll hand it over to, to Leslie to get us started here. Hey, everyone. Thank you for joining me. For any of you that's his first time, my name is Leslie Short. I'm the owner of the Cabo Group. I work with companies and organizations to help them expand beyond their current culture. And I do that through the diversity and inclusion lens. And by that, I mean gender and race and bias and disabilities. And I am not the, the banana of the tailpipe girl. I want to have honest conversations to move things forward. We all know that there's enough conversation out there uh, that's checking the boxes. I don't know about you, but I'm in an urgency to stop checking boxes and to actually get things executed. So a lot of things have brought on this conversation tonight. Um, articles that were um, that's happening right now, the fact that I'm a woman, shocking, a black woman, um, you know, you, you just go through, they just go through the check boxes. And I wanted to have the discussion, are women just becoming that, the check boxes, um, as part of diversity and inclusion? Uh, what does it mean to even be a woman nowadays? And by the way, everyone, you can start asking questions and jumping in, oh, that's me, sorry, and jumping in, um, this is a conversation. This isn't me just talking. This is us really having a conversation. So at any time, start asking questions or comments. So I just kick it off and then we go from there. So, okay, so are women, are they checking the boxes? Are white women the new face of diversity? When they say they want women, is it the way it's been written in some articles? We are looking for a woman, a woman. Okay, so that means one to me. Who is that one? Um, what does it look like to be a woman of color that's black, that's Hispanic, that's whatever you identify yourself as, uh, however you identify yourself? Is it a trans, you know, trans women are included in that? Uh, let's remember, what does that look like and what does that mean? Then clearly, I, if you saw me on LinkedIn and I posted two more articles um, that went with this, this theory. Clearly, the female soccer team who can't get the equal pay to save their doggone lives, yet they are out there every time. They're better than the men's. And I'm not saying they're better than the men's because they are. They're better than the men's because they are um, at this moment. But they haven't even been offered a contract that's equal to the men. Forget over. Then there was the article on the women leaders through this pandemic and in other countries. And shocking. All the countries that have women leading have somehow been able to maneuver this pandemic 10 times better than we have. I don't know if it's a man thing. I don't know if it's a resource thing. I'm just saying the facts are that there, I think it was six women or eight women that have rocked the pandemic as much as you can rock a pandemic to make their countries safer and sound. What does it mean to be a woman in the workplace? What does it mean to be a woman during this pandemic? Because all of a sudden you're a teacher, not that you worked before, but now you're teaching grades. <laughs> you have a different type of teaching. Your, your wife, your spouse, your partner, you're still working, you're an executive, you're a helper, whatever that is, the titles have grown longer. Yet, we're just expected to do it all. Um, black women have been holding up households for since history. Um, add this on top of it, add people losing jobs. And where does that leave black women in the mix of this? Where does it leave Hispanic women in the midst of this? What is it? And just again, jump in. And if there's men that's in this, I want to hear your voices. It's just as important. Is it important to you to have women leaders? Do you not care? Anybody, jump in with me. 
because this is just um, starting to get underneath my skin. And until someone jumps in, I'll keep going. So I was on a two day corporate, I will not call out their name right now, corporate American conference. And in the chat, and it was international. So there was, there was really people from everywhere. And a woman finished speaking as a keynote. And I swear to you, I couldn't get my phone fast enough to, to screenshot. Wow, that was really get, great to have a woman speaker. But to say that, I was offended through the laptop. Like, really? You're still excited because you see a woman speaker? And it was a tech. But whether it was, I don't care whether it was tech or if it was, it was cooking or it was sewing or it was fixing cars. It's still like we are, um, we're a little pebble. We're, we're still a pearl. And if you can find one of us that can speak and walk and behave, then yay for us. You know, I always say to, to women, I don't get excited. Don't come to me and tell me that you have a seat at the table. I don't care. I'm gonna be absolutely honest with you. I don't care. What I want you to say is, I have a seat at the table. I have a voice at the table. I am running the table. Or at least I have a voice at the table. Because see, as women, they have to let us through the door at this moment. There's no other option. One of us, somebody has got to be in there, right? So what does that mean? That doesn't mean anything if your voice is not respected in that room. And by respect, which is different for everyone, I mean it's a valid, added, value to the conversation um i see gender equity regarding taking care of children at home do you have a perspective on that i do not have children so i bow down to every single person that has a child number one because i can barely get myself out the door sometimes so if you can do all of that and do everything else you have to do god bless you go for it now if i had children which i purposely did not <laughs> um they, it would have to be an equal partnership. And, and let me be very clear, there is no such thing as equal. So that means the equality of your schedules at that time. That is something that you and your partner have to have that conversation with before you go into it. And then realize that things are going to shift. Because your great uh, agreement that happened a month and a half ago has to be shifted today. Because today everybody's at home. And, you know, I watched someone that was breastfeeding, that was doing the news, that was doing it. And she was like, I can't give it off to my husband because he's over there on the news, uh, you know, on a newscast as well. And he's doing weather, so he's moving. I would say there needs to be a, a, a equity in raising your children. It is no longer, I believe, one or the other. Women have them. Men have helped create them. <laughs> and therefore, I would assume you would help raise them. Um, you know, I Leslie. Yeah. Yes. Uh hi, I'm Curry Francis. I, I don't have children either. The reason why I'm asking that question is because um the com conversation keeps coming up um amongst coworkers at uh in actually within the industry is with the pandemic happening and school being a part of everybody's job responsibility. The tendency is um, children going to their mothers. It's not to say that all children do that, um, but not being able to give people guidelines on how to manage that and manage uh, work as well. I was just curious um, about your perspective in regard to the pandemic, not necessarily how they got in that situation, but more so how to how to manage it now that the situation is upon us. I think any family that's at home is upside down. Um, the man's upside down, the woman's upside down, the children are upside down. I think it's sitting down and having a conversation. And on the Today Show, I saw a great thing that Greg Melvin's wife does. She does a schedule. And so she has the kids and the kids have daddy time because he's off doing TV. And when she has to teach her class, then they know they're going to daddy time. And so the kids kind of see the schedule each day of where they're going. Doesn't mean that it goes off. And they're like, look, best laid plans, God has a joke. You know, is that, is that uh, saying? But that's how they have decided to handle it with their kids. And like with anything, you have to have that conversation and you have to be able to maneuver. 
I think also not only within the family, I think you have a job that may not respect the fact that kids are at home at this moment and that you're running your, your position, your home, and your mate may be still out working. They may be an essential worker. They may be working outside the house. And so you're now left at home alone trying to be a worker and be a mother. And again, I said yesterday on, a, on an interview that I had that communication is always going to be key. Sometimes you have to say to your boss, I cannot speak at 10 a.m. I can respond to emails right after that. But unfortunately, I'm in third grade at that time, <laughs> you know, and then again, do the best you can with kids. And this depends on the age, what they're going to understand. I hope I answered you. I, I, I think everyone, what it be a month and a half in, two months in? Yes. I'm still trying to figure that out. Oh, no, I totally agree. I totally agree. I'm just trying to. And I was also thinking, uh, just shifting gears, I think one of the things you had mentioned earlier was everybody's role or checking boxes and women checking boxes. I think pretty much everybody understands that white women have had the um, benefit of, of diversity efforts because of the, uh, because of the fact that they are, um, they have an intersectionality with, with white men. So it's easier to relate to women, white women, than it is women of color. So do you have a perspective on that? And, and um, just, I don't know, I'm throwing out questions out there. <laughs> that's great, that's great. So I, I, you know, I, so we will know each other, but you will know me now. Why don't you stay on camera? She asking the camera. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'll stay on camera. <laughs> so you don't know me, but you see how I am. So I yes. can say what I need to say and I move on. I've been called for whatever it's worth, and we can get into that. That's a whole nother conversation. The biggest white black girl there is. Why? Because I'm gonna have my three inch heels and I'm like, Bob, so this is how we're gonna do this. Are you ready? No? Okay, too bad. Let's go. And where I think the con the issue becomes, yes, they are comfortable. People are comfortable with what they know or what they perceive to know. What the perceptions, because it's not for everyone, perceptions of Black women is that we're going to come on strong, that we're going to have an opinion, that, oh, good, Sarah, I'm glad you joined me just in time, um, that we're going to um, boss up. Well, guess what? If there is something wrong and if there is something right, I'm going to have a voice because I don't need someone to give me that voice. So I will say to them, now, if they have to choose, I have to say I've been chosen over white women, but that's not the conversation, okay? The conversation is now that diversity and inclusion has 15 check boxes that I absolutely hate, Women or gender has been one. And we know in America, and this is in my book, in America, it's been race and gender. It's been under the diversity and inclusion umbrellas. Disabilities wasn't really under, you know, they kind of got pushed to the side, but now it's still for, for veterans which kind of shelved underneath their race and gender. But gender, just always says gender, right? But mm -hmm. now that it's forced to add women to boards, to add women before you get a big company gets funding. Now, all of a sudden, you see women popping up, but who do you see? White women, nine out of 10, right? Because they're comfortable and Mary's not gonna say, yo, you ain't get, you didn't bring Shirley along. We gonna get in there and be like, listen, for, for, for those that are really trying to advance, because everybody's not the same. So I don't wanna say everybody's pulling everyone up, but we, we're gonna go, Okay, so this is great. I'm here. What what, what we doing? You know that's not right. Who who what, what happened? And so they're like, oh God, we just wanted a woman. <laughs> Did you really need to like have a conversation? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, I, and not everyone, because I know some crazy powerhouse. You're a powerhouse. You're a powerhouse. I don't care what color you are. And I know some white women that are powerhouses. Excuse me on my language. If there's anyone balls to the wall, let's get this done. And I'm bringing my whole posse of women along with me. And, um, and there is a white woman that is my, I call her, she's my angel. 
she comes out of nowhere and be like, you're speaking at Forks, you're doing this. Why? Because she's like, I don't care what color you are. You have something to say, and I want every woman that has a voice to say it. But do we have the board members that all look alike in their blue suit, white shirt, and red tie? They're not prepared for that. Because even when we sit on a panel that's all women, they're like, that was entertaining. Wow, I didn't know. Can you speak to my daughter? Why? And I'll say to them, why? Why do you want me to speak to your daughter? Oh, you have such energy. How? Okay, and? Well, you know, you're smart. Am I? You know, like, you have to, you have to say thank you for I'm being smart? No. So because I challenge, and Sarah, go ahead, because I, I, I love your perspective on this, and you work with, Hispanic women and women all the time. Uh, which perspective? <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. Women, white women, checking the boxes, diversity, inclusion of women, you pick yours. Yeah, I think also um, even from like the Latino community, I noticed that a lot of Latinas that look like me that are lighter skin, more European looking, get chosen over my like Afro-Latina sisters or my just darker skin sisters and um, it, it's the truth. And I think even within our own communities, we need to be very aware of that. Um, because, you know, when people ask me to come and speak at a thing about immigration or whatever, I always say, you don't need me. I'm, I know I may make your like white boardroom comfortable, but I want you to talk to like this person um, who walking down the street is treated differently than I am, who isn't incognito Latino, like some of us can be when we need to be, right? Um, and so, yeah, I think, the discussion with white women pulling people in is also important in our, our different ethnicities, too, because, yeah, there, there's white privilege even in Latino culture. Um, and, yeah, that's just one thing. In the African American <laughs> culture, I think we can all say across the board, depending on where we are, what makes sense. There is in Hollywood a, when I go to a lot behind, behind set, there is a black woman style. Let's just put it that way, that they have become comfortable with. And you then if you go into the writer room, the black woman style that they are comfortable with um, shows up. And so there was, um, I, I- So just before we go to the second question, Leslie, sorry to interrupt. Um, there was a question from, uh, from Nicole, I think it was, on about how do we change the narrative? And just to add to that as well too, um, and we're talking about changing the narrative and it's something you hit on it as well. And I think just from, you know, a black culture as well as like, once you do get into the door, like, how do you go about effectively, like bringing other people with you, you know, in some of those boardrooms and some of those positions that you have as well. So I think that, I think that's, um, if you would speak to that as well too, like some effective ways of being able to do that. Greatly well, I always say I'm not the only voice and I'm very clear to make that clear that I have my perspective and I, I bring with my perspective 13 and a half years of not living in the United States and living in Europe and in Japan. So yes, I bring that international flair with me, which makes them comfortable, truth be told, but I'm not the only black female voice. And as I put even in the book, black preachers are not the only voices you need to hear when something goes awry or when you want a perspective. We are all separate. We are all come from a different narrative of, of living in life. And if you are trying to really speak to a audience or to expanding your diversity of thought, then you need to have more than one of anything or anyone along with you. And so I may get in the door, I may see what's happening, and I'll never forget a board meeting that my very first board meeting, I was the only one that looked like me, yet the celebrity that they were um, working on, I was the only one that looked like me and he was African-American, prominent, I'll just say it, Desmond Tutu. So you're dealing with Desmond Tutu, right? And I remember making a comment, like that doesn't make sense to me. Have you spoken to anyone in South Africa? You know, and have you, this doesn't make sense to the African-American community here. 
and they just looked at me and I remember the president and after the meeting he goes thank you for speaking up and I said oh my bad was I not supposed to I said no one told me I would allowed to speak he was like no that's why we brought you on the board because we don't I he was like I can no longer sit here and not have people contribute and push the envelope and push us to do better and so when there was an agency that came to speak to us about working on a project that had no one one from South Africa or looked like me um, or had the experience of working within the community because everyone doesn't need to look like us to understand us and us is Hispanic and us is black or us is but you need to have the sensibility to know what you know and when they said to me oh we're all one I said in the human race yes we are but when we're now speaking about speaking to communities and branching out you need to I need more than we are one and so I need you do you have anyone else within your organization I'm not trying to take the gig away from you at this particular moment but that is relevant to this project that comes from an experience that can bring added value and oh but and I said as soon as that oh but I was like I don't feel like you're the best for the agency I vote no in front of their face very clear there was no misunderstanding and then I said, I have an agency that I believe can really do this job, that understands not only South Africa, but also understands the market for which we're speaking to, and I will bring them in. I said, but they will not come in on the, I'm so happy to work here. They will come in at their fee. And I made that clear, that their fee would need to be paid for what they are worth. Because that also happens where we're we're under the assumption that our fees should be lower because we should be happy to be in a room. And what are some of the things, uh, just to add to that, what are some of the things that we can take away just from that, you know, as people to to kind of advocate for one another as well? Because I can I can I can admit as a male, you know, if I'm if I'm in a place, I'm not necessarily advocating for women in particular but I'm going in advocating for other black people that look like me being in part because a lot of the spaces that I'm in, I am the only person that looks like me. So I guess the question, not I guess, the question is like, how, how can we as individuals um, and all as one as well to go in and advocate for one another? Is there some, there's some quick tidbits that we could take to go in and like fight for causes that, that, that <laughs> so help advance one, I break this out in three parts, okay? I break this out as a champion. A champion is someone, this is my definition, a champion is someone who that has the conversation about you when you're not in the room. Have you looked at, have you seen, do you know? An advocate is someone that's like, you really need to bring them in and have this conversation with them. They do amazing work. Okay? You should have this. You don't know them. We need to connect. This is the person. You need. An advocate is a little bit different. A champion is for the cause. Advocate is putting you in the room or getting that in there. And then that ally People want to call themselves allies, but honestly, I don't believe you can call yourself an ally. Someone else has to call you an ally. I want to see that you're doing the work that is part of your DNA of what you do. It's not, I don't have to think about bringing someone of color or a woman into the room. I think it is who is best for what's happening. I don't want to get caught up on only black women, or only Hispanic women. I want to say, if that's a position and it's open for a woman, I'm going through my mental Rolodex, who I think could be the best one that's gonna execute. Who's on my team that I can bring? Who can I bring on my team that's gonna rock with me? And in my, my mental, my personal mental Rolodex, I have everybody from all sorts of nationalities. But I'm always going to go, is there, is there someone, look, we all work with people we like, right? Everybody knows that. You get hired by people you like. But I'm also going to be, who's going to execute on this? I'm going to call Sarah. I'm going to call a man. I'm going to call him. Because I'm going to know who has the strength. And if it's another woman walking into the room, great. Because I know that that woman, if a part of my circle, advocates for everyone, always. I'm, re I'm reading and talking. Well, we had a question from 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 Nance. Apo apologies, it was probably like ten minutes ago. Um, but we're on a roll, so um, I'm gonna open it up and you can ask that question directly, Nance. 
um, and, and give some context behind it as well too. Sorry. Yeah, I, would, I, I guess what I was responding to is um, <laughs> quite a while back, there's so much content, right? Um, <laughs> Look, I'm a white woman. I would put myself on camera, but you'll, you know, it's like, yeah, I'll be honest. It's like, um, you put yourself on camera. You're one of the people that call for things too. Put yourself on camera. <laughs> I look, and I'm also dealing with like this whole issue around, you know, as a as an average looking white woman who's gotten older, I see that so often the women that are pushed forward, no matter what their background is, a lot of times you have to have the credentials, but you also have to be a certain, you know, conventional look or something along those lines. And I do think that that may play into then this, this kind of experience of feeling special because people you know tend to do more for attractive women and they you know and i think what what i've seen over my years in business is that then there's this in there's this kind of unwillingness to help other people and there's that cattiness that we are unfortunately thought to have in the workplace and that women don't get along and they're terrible to work for and stuff like that and I think, you know, this is part of it also is that we're, we sometimes live into the stereotypes, right? And I'm, you know, I see myself, I've done all of that. And now I'm at a point in my life where I'm like, screw it. I have the, I have the credentials. I've done the work. I'm here. I'm doing it. You either work with me or you don't. And that impacts me financially, but you know, I might live with myself. <laughs> and so, so <laughs> I, I guess what I'm getting at is that we have to be careful of putting anybody in a box. And I think that came out in the conversation later because there are so many reasons that we, that as women and anybody, right? Like we're all struggling to find our voice and we know where, we know where the power is still held, right? And, and one of the things I missed the one last week and I'm so sorry for that because I know that's another part of it is that the majority of us that are pulling ourselves up are doing it in ways through small businesses and outside organizations and, and communities like this and we're doing it at the at the grassroots level and and then we have you know the virus and the lack of funding pull everything out from under us so i guess part of it is just to keep reminding everybody what what you've said um all of you've said it is that Every single one of us has our own stuff that we're, we're dealing with in the virus, in our day-to-day -day lives. You know, people ask me all the time, why wasn't I doing more earlier? I was like, well, my mom was dying of cancer. I had had a head injury. Um, my nephew didn't have a parent, right? Like, I wish I had been able to do more, but I'm here now. <laughs> so, so we have to embrace like whatever we can do together whenever we can do it <laughs> and look, let's be honest everybody can't come along right. every woman, you can't bring every woman you can't bring every person that's not what this is about this is about you bring along who you feel can execute who has the talent for what they bring to the table that's who you bring along and you know, yes, yeah, so there's going to be, there's always the bias of what someone looks like when you first walk into a room to what you can execute. That's great. As women, before we even get to the men, need to stop pitting each other against each other and say, right. this is the best person I'm going to work with and walk in with and do that. Because men are just, I don't want to group that. Let me take that back. I believe men are just going, <laughs> being political for a second. Um, hey, get a woman, get someone in here, let's go. If she's pretty and can walk through the room, that's even better. And I've heard that said. You know? um, but I've also been told, oh, you dress better than the client. Okay, well, <laughs> I was getting hired for, but great, whatever. Uh, you know, so it's a different way that. I, men may be approaching women, then women going, oh, um, I, I got to be the first one in. I want to say I was the first. I'm used to women yeah. all, and I've been called, even my ex-husband said, you know what? You have balls of steel. Like, I, you come through and you work hard. You're, you're not a girly girl. And I'm like, well, 
okay, whatever that means, because I'm in my <laughs> chills and I'm in my skirt and if I'm not a girly girl to you, then that's on you. So it's also understanding we have to play the game differently than men have to play. And that was one of the things that I would say. We yeah, have I think that was what I was trying to say, play. sorry. Yeah, no, that, that's perfect. We have to know when to walk in and how to walk in and read the room. Men don't have to read the room. They hit you with the, hey, bud, hey, dude. And they, they're good. We've got to go in and do a complete scan. If you're a black woman, how many other black women are in the room? You're Hispanic, how many are Hispanic? And if you're a woman, period, how many women are in the room? And then you got to go. Well, I, will, I will just say, sorry to interrupt you on that. I will say this. Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> Some men do have to scan the room. Right. right. You're in. So I, I just want to make sure there is a there's a clarification there. Okay. And, and I agree that was thank you for that, because I was about to call on you to say, get in here, because because that is something I think we all have to be aware of is that depending on where we're going, we all have to read the room. And and it's it's really interesting because I love this group. I've been on a, a number of these calls and I know you guys are all in this. I think everybody on here, we're all in it trying to create community and lift each other up. But it's hard, right? Like when sometimes we get confronted by our own little demons here, right? Like the, you know, I've been there where I felt threatened and then I feel myself triggered by it. And then I want to get defensive. And now I know how to recognize that and go, don't get defensive listen look you know what can i learn here what and then my job is to figure out what i'm defensive about and deal with that right because in a matter of a second because i think anybody can feel that whether somebody comes at them a different way or it's about the hair or it's just you brush it against or whatever that is the the, the trick is um knowing when to say what to say and how to say it because yes for women it will be you're emotional stop being emotional or um you're too aggressive don't be aggressive uh, you know it's it's all those stereotypes that have to deal with but there's also a way of being able to step back and step forward because there i'm not the go back and email kind of girl i'm the i'm i am honestly going to be i'm sorry what you just say and you know that has thrown them off and i'm like I, I i'm confused and there was somewhere where i had to work where there the white men were very aggressive but they were very aggressive with their salesmen that was them and i said and they said something f you something because that's how they spoke to their their salesmen and i twirled on my little heels and i said who exactly are you speaking to and they were like well you said i said no you're confused. Maybe the other black men that you have dealt with, they're the first African-American folks you have dealt with. I'm the first crazy black chick you've dealt with right now. My parents don't speak to me that way. We're in a business situation. Don't ever raise your voice to me again. And they looked and someone overheard it and they're like, yo, the new girl's crazy. Yo, she just got at them. Nobody's gotten at them. And I said, it's not about me getting at them. You came at me aggressive. I will not allow that to happen. So I want to just stop it now and not allow it. I'm not anyone's mother or mama or whatever else boxes you would like to put women in sometimes in, in, in work. I am who I am. I stand by my work. I walk with my head held high. I'm, I'm the first one to say I'm wrong or I'm not wrong. It sometimes feels, and I think you all can tell me though, that some days feel like, it, why do I have to fight for the simplest thing? <laughs> like, why is this always a conversation? And that's why I put up for the soccer team and they said, here's the explanation. And I was like, oh, there's always an explanation. There's always something somebody's got to say and just instead of doing the right thing. I'm trying to read it. Yeah, there's been a lot of uh, commentary to everyone in there. So, um, so yeah. 
I don't know. I don't know where where you wanna where you wanna start at. But um, if anybody, I mean, you can unmute yourself if you have a question to to make this. Um, Hi, Micah. It's Kim Ellison. How are you? Well, hello. Hi, Micah. Hi. How are you doing? Good. Hey, Leslie. It's Kim Ellison. Um, hi everyone. Um, you are so right about the position that you take, Leslie, in speaking with people because I worked construction for about, let's see, 13 years. I was a risk manager at one international company, and then I went to work at another domestic company. Um, everybody does things differently, but some people who are in power positions, they forget. They let that go to their head and they will speak to you in a certain way. And one of the CEOs that I work with, he was one of those people. But what I did, not embarrassing him, but what I did is one day he was in the coffee room and I brought something to his attention. He was like, you know, Kim, I never thought about that. So I think it's the position that we also take, not necessarily like um, Nancy saying is that don't get it, not being intimidated, but also standing in your power and knowing when to step back and when to raise your voice, when to raise your hand and say, you know what, this is not right. Something needs to be said and not necessarily embarrassing people, but also bringing things to people's attention. Because I think a lot of times people are unconscious of their bias. They've been doing it for so long. It's just become a regular habit for them when they don't interact a lot of times with minorities unless they're in the workplace and they come with a certain um i would say lens they're looking at us with a certain lens so yes like you leslie i've also been the only black woman like sitting at the table i've also been the only black woman walking the site and you're getting the looks from different people like oh who's she well where does she come from where does she come from it is all about how you carry yourself and if you respect human beings the way you want to be respected they do give the respect back and that's something that I have, I can definitely attest to as being a woman who was in a heavy male <laughs> industry where um, I did get the respect that I needed. You know, a lot of times, it actually, I got more respect sometimes from the men than I did from the women. The women would challenge me more on certain issues <laughs> than the men would. Um, so I think that that's really important to, number one, to know who you are, no matter what. I mean, that comes down with anyone. You have to know who you are. If you want to walk with somebody, if you want to be suggested, you want women or, or men or anyone to be your ally champion, you know, you've got to have, what are you offering up to who you are for that? You know, we can't just also sit back and go, I'm, I'm cool, I'm a woman, I'm in. Now, for some people that may work, but at some point, and my some point is today, you've got to go in and be ready. Hey, do you um, you got to go in and be ready to um, to work. Be ready to say, "This is who I am, and this is what I do." And I love uh, Sarah's comment. Yeah, you don't shouldn't be concerned. Are you an angry black woman or the super smart Asian or this and the other? No, I'm a super smart whoever I am, and this is what I am. And I never forget. I um, one of the women that works with me at the cover group, um, Lynn we met at the un and she said in the un if you've ever gone to the event sometimes it's kind of like huh and everyone was writing and they're writing and they get so excited when they're writing and oh my god the black girl's going to speak about something i'm going to take notes and i got up there and i said i need everyone to put your pens down my name is leslie short and i'm a black woman and today we're going to have that conversation and if you could have seen the blood kind of drain out of everyone i'm like i don't know why we just can't say it own who you are, but you don't have to live with your fist up or your hands in a, in a uh, you know, your Asian bowing or as a white woman giggling. We can walk in with the strength of the knowledge that we bring to the table. And I think, yes, there's going to be men that appreciate that. And there's going to be men that's not. There's going to be women that appreciate it, and there's going to be women that's not. Hey, say something. I saw that. Leslie, it looks like um, Nicole had a question. Yes, I guess. Hi, everyone. I and thank you. I just a quick question about the unconscious bias because it happens so frequently, and I work in a predominantly white male environment. So when that bias comes through, it becomes very difficult to speak up without feeling intimidated. I'll give you a, a very short example. The president of the company stopped by my office one day and said, "You know, this black guy spoke to me in the elevator," and I'm thinking, "Oh wow, this can't be real. <laughs> this is not." 
happening. And I know that he is very experienced. And it became the balance of understanding, was it really unconscious? Was it something that he was expecting me to speak on? So what happens in those, what should you do when those situations come up and uh, be able to stand in your power and speak up? So it depends. Speak up. So it also depends on the situation. If he was in your office and he just said a black guy came up to him in the elevator, is that is that all he said? Sorry, sorry about that. No, actually, we were debriefing a training session. Um, someone came in from a vendor and delivered a training uh, to all white, you know, uh, team, predominantly male, and uh, just he, the president bumped into the facilitator in the elevator back. And then the president was on his way to his office and say, hey, you know, this black guy just started talking to me in the elevator bank. And then he was discussing the training. And I, the way he posed it, then he asked me, how did we find him? Where did we find the facilitator? And I had, I was like, who vetted the, the facilitator? And then he said he had received some feedback. He wasn't sure if that person would come back again. And within a week, we did not bring that person. First thing, this is me, so I'm going to give you the way that I would do it, then I'll give you the way you probably should do it. Because <laughs> if he had said, oh, I bumped into a black man, I went, today is your lucky day. Because I, I throw them off sometimes with humor, and I'll be like, well, is today your lucky day? Were you nice? And, you know, and then they, because then they now they know I need to think about what I'm saying. And... You know, and then if it was, well, I don't know if this person is right, I would ask, okay, I vetted, I vetted him. What was the feedback that you did not feel that he was right? And what was it about the training? Was it about him personally or was it the training? And I would, I would have broken it down for him and said, you know what, I'm just going to write some questions out for you. And if you don't mind kind of filling them out, because that also means he had to think about them on email to come back to me with. That's what I would love to see because I too am usually the only black one in, in the white offices doing trainings. And then I, you know, it is a matter of being able to say, I was doing an assessment for a company and this was in the leadership and I tell the story. Is she on the phone? Is she on here? Maybe she said she was coming. She knows what it is. So I'm not going to say the company. And someone, a white gentleman said to another white man, and it was very innocent. Oh, He's the, um, he's the wizard. And, I went, huh. and then two seconds later, he was like, he's the grand wizard. Huh. So I, <laughs> I didn't say anything that day because I was doing assessment of the company, right? The next day, I, when I was sitting with the CEO, I said, I want to bring something to your attention. I realized it was very innocent, but if there was someone else or other African Americans, and they heard that. That's a trigger. That could have been a whole humor. That could have been a whole issue. Understanding that he didn't say it like that. He was giving you a compliment of how you fix this problem. And I knew where he was coming, but somebody else sitting there would, would may not have. And so when I went to the person and I pulled him aside and I said, "I would like to share something with you," and the, again the blood drained from his face, and I said, "This is what." unconscious bias looks like and sounds like. And this is why you need to be aware of how, what wording you're using in situation. He's like, but I didn't mean that. I said, I'm, I'm aware you didn't mean it. I honestly believe in my heart you did not mean this. But this is still how it sounds. And sometimes that's what you have to say. You may not have meant it like that, but this is the way it sounds. And yes, I'm sorry, we have to sugarcoat it. <laughs> Just want to let you know, Leslie, I mean, this time, these hours go by fast, you know, we're at, we're at 50 after. Um, so if anybody has any questions, um, uh, would like to connect to LinkedIn. I know you're going to say that, but just jump, put your LinkedIn in and connect with each other. I can be found Leslie shirt on LinkedIn, but it's really about everybody connecting. Mike, go ahead. Yes. I mean, still in my thunder. That was five minutes. That was five minutes in the future. I was going to say that, but okay. Um, uh, yes. but just please start doing that. <laughs> Um, one last question, well, at least the question that I had as well, um, you know, again, as far as checking the boxes and talking about, you know, diversity and, and the women is essentially, I want there to be a world where it doesn't matter, you know, 
how you identify yourself or what color you are physically or anything else of the sort. So I, I can say the question I have is like, where do we go? Like, what can we do as individuals that are on this call right now to, to make change within our organizations and the networks that we have here? What are some of the things that we can, we can do actively to, to move to that, you know, that, that future where it shouldn't matter whether, you know, as Nicole stated, bringing in a black guy and then, you know, the CEO saying this are some of the, some of the other comments like Nance saying, you know, being, feeling the way that she's feeling in certain environments um, based for a woman. So what can we do? It starts before we get to the workplace. You can't get to work and then go, Ooh, let me, let me be friendly with everybody. Your life has to be, I'm going to be aware who's in the bodega down the corner. Who's in my supermarket with a hijab? I'm going to be aware of my surroundings and be open to say hello to people in my surroundings that may not look like me or walk like me. That's the first thing. You need to be aware uh, and understand your biases as well. And then when you're in the workplace, when something is said, be comfortable enough to be able to pull that person to the side and just say, I just want to give you a heads up. That was uncomfortable to me and here is why. Or you may want to rephrase that because this is the way that I heard it. And you may or may not have thought about it that way. We have to speak up. We can't assume that what bothers us bothers someone else. You know, so therefore it's important for us to be able to open up and say, comfortable or go to the person that you saw it happen and just say did that bother you you can't we can't be an advocate or ally or champion for everyone right but you can also be someone that when something happens someone knows that they can come to you as well and be like oh i can't believe that just happened that just went down like that and be able to have that but it starts from each of us and how we move in our own personal world. When I was called in to produce a Asian event, and I say it was the Asian event because it was for the Asian market, and it was a Asian targeted event, so I can say it was an Asian event. And I walked into the meeting, and one of the Asian brand managers looked and said, oh, I didn't, why are you here? Why is the Urban Agency here? I said, excuse me, baby, I'm black, but I'm not an urban agency. I happen to be the producer of this entire series. And before I could get up in him, the person that had hired me was Asian woman swooped in and was just like, Leslie's in charge. And just like, she shut it down before. Cause she knew I had no problem. Cause I was just like, I'm offended. The urban agency, I'm always going to be black. That's not going to change. I don't plan on pulling a Michael Jackson. I don't plan on lighting. Even then, at the end of the day, we are who we are. We can lighten or darken as much as we want. So it's about, again, knowing who you are, being ready to say, that doesn't work for me. We're gonna When we go back into whatever office this looks like, when we're allowed outside again, right? And we're allowed to play again. There's going to be a lot happening. And my theory is that every company needs to hire an outside diversity and inclusion person that's going to deal with bias, not speak about bias, be there to deal with bias, a, um, a trauma coach, and a grief counselor. Because when we all walk back into wherever you're going, we all have dealt with those three things at some point in this whether you were an advocate or reading an article about something that pissed you off, because right now I'm very pissed off about an article and something that's happened, and I do this for a living, or if it happened to you or a family member or a friend, we're going to need to deal with that before you ever tell me to hit a button and talk about sending that report. Leslie, just one more question. It looks like we have one last one from a dot Lewis. I'm not saying that we're related, but we could be related to this. I could be related to this person. So uh, I'll let her ask. Yes. Um, I won't confirm or deny any of that. Uh, but <laughs> 
I, I have a question. Um, I guess um, being in a situation where I experienced bias, but it was from individuals and who are part of my own, like, you know, African American um, women, minority women, like how, how do you deal with, how do you start um, dealing with bias when it comes from within your own community? in the workplace? So I always, and I saw, I, I'm thinking of how I wanna answer you because there's so, I have so many stories about that, exactly that, that I don't know where to go with that. It's, it comes back again, who are you? And why do they matter to you? I have pissed more people off ignoring them than addressing it. For whatever reason, a lot of times bias has to do about that person. It doesn't have to do with me. And so I won't play into it. You know, because I was a classical ballet dancer, the kids threw a Twinkie me, not the kids, the little black girls threw a Twinkie at me on the school bus saying, I thought I was all of that and I had to be white on the inside. I was dancing ballet at seven and nine. And um, I was just like, and I called her the B word, I won't lie, I think I was nine. And my mother's like, you can't do that. And I'm like, it's a female dog. I have nothing else to say to her. If you're gonna be bold enough to come at me, and I always had a mouth, then you be bold enough to take it. I don't deal with that. Unless you're sabotaging my work, then you are not relevant to me. Now, if you come at my work or my work ethic, you better be ready. You better have everything you ever thought you could find on me because I'm coming back word for word, pound to pound about how I've executed what I needed to execute. So everyone's not going to be our friend. And if for some reason the, the Black women within the group has an issue with you, again, that's their issue. And you notice how it's a group and nine out of 10, not an individual. Because that bias comes in groups sometimes. And that's what gives it strength. Don't allow that to give you strength. Okay? Keep doing what you're doing. And you know what you really want to piss them off? Walk by and smile. <laughs> that takes everybody because then they realize, wait, what, what, what? We're not getting to her? No, we're not getting to you. And that is the best advice I can give to you is keep remembering that it's about them. It's not about you. Um, I know we're almost out of time. I have two things. Can I say my two things? You, hey, you go, as long as you see the time. <laughs> One, um, every, I, I see a lot of LinkedIn. I, of course, am not writing anything down. Please connect with me on LinkedIn at Leslie Short. We'll love to say that. Also, if there are topics that you would like to discuss, I really want to hear them. I'm thinking about next week on does representation matter? That is not, so that's across the board, disabilities. Um, women, men, size, ageism, it's, it's, it's all of that. Does representation, does it matter? There's some companies that I think are doing amazing jobs uh, with representation, there's some. <laughs> uh, um, so, you know, how do you fake it? Are they faking it till they make it? That's one of the things I'm thinking about, but I am open, this forum, is about everyone that's on here. I want us to be able to have these conversations and if there's someone else that can that can that can help with, with a Lewis answering those questions, I want us to be able to put it in the chat or raise your hand because this is how we as women, this is how we as people continue to gain our voice. When we know that there are like mind people walking this walk with us, whether we may ever come outside or not, or we only see each other in the screen. We need to know that there are people that are fighting the fight for just being able to have the justice for which we each deserve. I am a huge believer in that. Sounds a little Pollyanna, I'm sorry. It is what, but it is what I believe. Um, bye, Nicole. Uh, I see she had to jump off. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, so yeah, I'll keep, it, I'll keep this open a little bit longer so everyone can connect via chat. Um, cause once I, um, once I close this down, then you can no longer connect via chat. So, um, and I don't have any records of the chat. 
So if you want to connect, I'll keep it open for another five minutes as well. Um, also, if you want a recording of this conversation, I, is it good to send it out? Yeah, so it's I'll send you out a recording of this conversation as well. Um, because we do record these, um, and yeah, I, I want to say as, as everyone's connected as well to thank you again, Leslie. Um, I know you numbered this as number 4, but actually, this is our 5th time. You know, the village collective has done a conversation with you. Um, the 1st, 1, starting back in what was it? February when we did the 1st face to face 1 with investors and everything. So there were people in chairs. Yes, yes. <laughs> It was right before, right before all of this went down. So, um, so we were in, we were in talks to do something about do it for women's history. Yep. And well, we know how that. Yes. Okay. And then, yeah, we all, we all started doing this. So, um, so yeah. And again, as Leslie said as well, um, we love, you know, topics and conversations and we're going to keep this going on as long as people decide to RSVP and, and, and come to it, have these conversations. Cause um, one of the initial conversations that Leslie and I had was that there's a lot of topics that need to be discussed, but no one's getting together to discuss those conversations and in um, those topics. And I think that's the only way that we can move forward as a society is once we start peeling back those layers and have those truly honest conversations. So, you know, I'll say from from my end, I'm deeply appreciative to everyone who decides to RSVP and have these conversations. I mean. These are things that really need to be had from not only from the workplace, but in, in homes and communities at large. So, again, thank you um, for taking the time out and spending you know, this time to, to chat with us. I, I, I say thank you nice as well. <laughs> yes, there, there's a lot. You know, I was on, like I said, I was on this conference today and it was so Pollyanna. And the bias that you bring with you <laughs> happened to be, and I was like, I'm going to fill my laptop. I'm gonna throw my laptop. I'm gonna throw my laptop. And I literally was just like, I, I knew someone at the company. I was like, do you have anything to do with this conference? When it's over in another day, can we have a conversation? Because I'm like, if you're gonna do that, then bring people that are gonna be like, listen, this is what bias is. This is how we deal with it on our own. Sometimes you can't fight that because it's not about you, it's about someone else. What I can do when I go in to train is do a quiz to actually show someone what the bias looks like. You know, one woman fought with me and told me she had no bias. And then when she took my little quiz, exactly, okay, exactly what I did when she said that. And when the, she took my little quiz, <laughs> she came after, she came up and she was like, I, I, I thought I was, I thought I was good. I, I, I realized I have to do better. And I'm like, we all have a bias. It's, it's to, to the degree of, do we recognize it? And do we call ourselves on it when it shows up? So, yeah, we have a lot to discuss. And like I said, I'm open to all topics and I really appreciate everyone joining. Yes. All righty. Thank you again. And thank you again, everyone. Um, see you next week as well. Um, and yeah, have a great one. Have a, have a great one. Everyone stay safe. Bye. I don't know how to get cut off. <laughs>